He had a 52-inch chest and a 32-inch waist. He was like a wedge and one of the nicest guys you'd ever want to meet. He was one of them. And when he saw me on the set, he said, Great, Mike, we'll go work out at lunch. They had fixed up a small gymnasium for him, and he would uh, go and work out. He always welcomed me. Mm -hmm. He liked me, and uh, I liked him. He was, was a great guy, great guy to be around. Easy going, uh, good looking, not full of himself as so many actors can be from time to time. And uh, he was out like that. He was just really a great guy to be around. Hi, I'm Rob Word. Welcome to A Word on Westerns. We have a gentleman with us today who has done hundreds of films. My God, how long is this episode going to run? Maybe hours? It's taken hours to set it up because we're at his house. And I'm talking about the very versatile actor, Michael Forrest. Michael, welcome to your house. <laughs> You're very welcome. I'll tell you that. So, After all of this work of setting it up and so forth. Well, I'm glad you welcomed us here. This is a, you bet. A, a real treat. I have seen you in so many different films. Really? I, I was telling Michael earlier that I went out of town and I set my DVR to record anything that you were in. Uh -huh. And I came back home after seven days and there were almost 20 shows that you were in ready for me to screen, oh, which I have done now. Well... Uh there's so many I've done, and I don't remember half of them of what you mentioned. Uh, you know, I just well, it's going to be a test for us. Okay, today, a test. okay, all right. The first Western I have you appearing in, according to IMDb, is a Cheyenne episode from 1956, and you were billed not as Michael Forrest, but as Charlebois. Gerald Charlebois. Yes. By a real name, yeah. Well, I like that name. <laughs> Well, the problem was that the casting people, every time I'd come in and uh, say that name, they'd say, well, how do you spell that last name? S? I said, no. C? S? C? And I said, no, no. So it got to the point where Charlebois was so difficult for these people to try to say it, I thought, well, I'll just uh, change my name. So I did. I took my middle name, Michael, and Bois in, uh, is, in, in French means forest or wood. So I decided to go with Forrest, Michael Forrest. Well, it worked. Yeah. How did you land an agent as uh, Charlie Bois? I, 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 don't, I don't recall getting my first agent, to tell you the truth. It was like, I don't know. I just have no idea. Well, you're a lucky boy then, getting <laughs> a, a part. And you played a lot of Native Americans early on. Too. I did. Yeah, I did. Until a certain point where I said, you know, I try, they were written so one-dimensional. Yeah. And I tried to make them with some depth, three-dimensional. And it was almost impossible to do it because of the way they were written. So I, at a certain point, I told my agent, I said, look, don't put me up for Indians anymore. I just, I, I just can't make them work. And this was shortly before I found out that I am an American Indian, a quarter, a quarter American Indian. I'm a, a Chippewa and Sioux Indian. And born in North Dakota. Born in North Dakota, in Harvey, North Dakota. Oh, my. How is Harvey today? I don't, you know, it's been a long time since I've been there. I went there, uh, I was at a convention. Uh, um, I don't know, I guess it was a Western convention in North Dakota. And uh, I drove through Harvey, and it was like I—I I was an infant when I, when I was born, of course, obviously. When I okay, wow. thanks for straightening uh, that I, out. Uh, yes, we're getting and, letters on that. And I—I—I <laughs> I, I, I never spent any time there as a child, but I—I I do know that I—that's where I was born. Where did you grow up then? Actually, I grew up in Seattle, mm -hmm. Seattle, Washington. Um, until I was 22, and uh, then I made a move to uh, L.A. It was either L.A. or New York. Had you done theater work in Washington? No, in Seattle. I did a lot of theater work. Mm -hmm. 
And I, I, I bless those days because I learned, because I had about as much talent as this floor. The only reason I got into it was because I had a friend who was brilliant as an actor, and he was getting all of these. Well, one day he came by my place. I was shooting some. And he had that blonde on each arm. No, oh, no, okay. he didn't. Have, but he said, "I said, where are you going to?" Uh, he said, I'm, "I'm going to the theater." I said, "The theater." I said, well, "What are you going to do there?" He said, "Well, I, I'm doing a play. This was on a Saturday." And I said, "Well, can I go with you?" And he said, "Sure, yeah, sure, come on." So here in this theater. There were like 200 kids in the theater, the Seattle Repertory Playhouse, and he played a character called Bobino. And I stood backstage part of the time and out in the audience, and I watched him getting all of these laughs. The kids loved him. And I thought, wow, I want to get a little bit of that. Well, as I said, I had as much talent as this floor. And uh, so I started working in the theater there. and. I, I didn't know anything. I didn't know a thing, but I began to learn. And I would watch what other people did, and I'd kind of copy them. And one thing led to another. I got bigger and better roles, and I began to learn something. I really did. I learned about acting from Pop James and Mrs. James. They were from New York originally, and it was... They really taught me. I, that didn't mean I was an accomplished actor when I left there, but I learned an awful lot. Theater acting is really a lot different from film acting. Oh. What made you choose Los Angeles and Hollywood instead of New York? For one thing, it was closer, <laughs> closer to Seattle. I didn't have any money at the time I was married, and I thought, well, it's easier to drive to L.A., than to fly, which costs so much money to go to New York. And that's why I came to L.A. And um, I got, I did a play. I did a play, I forget the name of the theater. At any rate, I did this play. And as a result, I got an agent out of the, by doing this play. And uh, I did a um, Lux Video. My first major role was in Lux Video. Was that a live television broadcast? Live show. Mm -hmm. And I opened and closed every scene except one. And I learned later that they were taking bets that I wouldn't be able to do it because I'd never done a live show. I did it. Right. I did it. And uh, I'm not saying I was great in it, but it was called Miss Susie Slagos. Who was in that with you? Do you recall? Oh. Lillian Gish's sister. Dorothy Gish. Dorothy Gish, yes. Sorry I forgot that, Dorothy. Oh. But, and I remember, Most people forget Dorothy anyway. It's funny, I came on the set. We were shooting now. Came on the set, and she was there on the set, and I greet her. And her face was twitching. And I thought, oh my God. If, if Dorothy Gish is nervous, I can't be. I just can't be. And I to calm me down, calm me down. How did you hook up with Jeff Corey, the acting oh. teacher? Well, Jeff Corey was well known to a lot of the actors, and through the actors I had met, they were talking about him, and that I should get into his class. And uh, I did. I applied and got in, and it was wonderful. I met so many, some of the best actors um, that I... Touch Connors, Michael Connors. Remember him? Sure. Well, Mike Connors did some of those early Roger Corman films, and didn't Roger attend a couple of those classes? Yes, he did, as a matter of fact. That's where I met him. And as a matter of fact, he asked me um, he asked me once at the end of a, a class, he says, I'm doing this film called uh, Sea Serpent. What was it? The Viking Women versus the Sea Serpent. Uh, Viking, a, a, great, a great poster. For that film, right. the movie, it's a Roger Corman film. What can I say? Well, well he, he said, you know, you're going to be nothing more than a, an extra. And then I said, that's fine. You know, I'll, I'll be glad to do it. So the first thing I get on the set, they're passing out these fright wigs. 
to put on the top of your head. And I said, no, no, I'm not going to put on a fresh wig. And uh, I went to Roger and I said, do I have to wear this? And he said, no, no. Yeah, the Vikings had that 50s haircut, yeah, didn't they? Right. Sure. <laughs> well, my hair was quite long at the time, so uh, I got away with it. But what I, I made a point of standing always next to the head heavy, the bad guy. And uh, when they would do a close-up of him, uh, Roger would say, well, who else is in the shot? They said, well, Michael is there. <laughs> Michael is in the shot, too? And I'd say, well, it was him, Roger. Uh, okay, include him in the shot. So I was always getting a close-up with that. Uh, so you learned right away about I learned, film acting. I yeah. learned from it. And I made more of it than just an, uh, an extra. And I had a lot of fun on it. Then you moved into television, though, and did... Uh, that was the heyday, the 50s of Westerns. Oh. And so you did several Cheyenne episodes. Oh, yeah. Too. Do you remember Clint Walker and what he was like? Clint, Clint was wonderful. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was a guy six foot six or six foot seven, something like that. And um, he had a 52 inch chest and a 32 inch waist. He was like <laughs> a wedge and one of the nicest guys you'd ever want to meet. He was one of them. And when he saw me on the set, he said, great, Mike, we'll go work out at lunch. They had fixed up a small gymnasium for him, and he would uh, go and work out. And when somebody like me came on the show, always, uh, always like to work out, I'd go with him and we'd work it out and then rush to, to the commissary and have a bowl of soup and then get on the set. But he always was, he always welcomed me. Mm -hmm. He liked me and I, I liked him. He was, was a great guy, great guy to be around. Easy going, uh, good looking, not full of himself as so many actors can be from time to time. Uh, he was out like that. He was just really a great guy to be around. Well, everybody says that about him. I met him a, a few times yeah. and spent some time with him at the Golden Boot Awards. Yeah. And people still love him. Oh, he was. He died recently, didn't he? Yes, he did. And I was so sorry. He lived up in Northern California, as I recall, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And he had a piece of property in Kanab also, so... Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, he was a real outdoorsman. Oh, he was. Yeah. He was. When he said he was going out and pan for gold, <laughs> he was going out to pan for gold. He lived in a tent. Oh, geez. One of the episodes, because you did several of on Cheyenne, yeah. you had the beautiful, unknown starlet Angie Dickinson. Magic. In addition to the Cheyenne with her, you had also done shootout at Medicine Bend with Angie, Jim Garner, who was also in your Cheyenne, yes, that's right. and Randolph Scott. Randolph Scott. What was Randolph Scott like? Well, Randolph Scott was an interesting guy. He um, he did so many westerns. I mean, he was in every western that was ever made. I guess. Well, he didn't even make that a priority in his career until the the mid 40s he had That's done right. Astaire Rogers films oh, yeah. and comedies and you know, Shirley yes. Temple two well, Shirley was Temple a, movies and in, in, in the 30s he was very handsome oh yes young handsome mm -hmm. guy and looked good in a tux oh he was tall yeah good looking guy but we know him and love him as a western star oh now. well i know and he was a, a great guy to work with he was had a great sense of humor a very funny guy those two unknown up-and-comers in that film also were in the Cheyenne, and they each got shows of their own. Jim Garner signed with Warner Brothers, and they put him into Maverick. It was built yeah. around his persona. Camera yeah. loved him. Well, you know, I got to know him pretty well on that film. We we, uh, uh, we didn't have that many scenes, but we've been when they were uh, lighting scenes and so forth, I mean, he and I would chat and talk, and he had done this film with uh, Brando. Uh, Sayonara. Sayonara. He had done it before. And, and that was a Warner Brothers film too, probably. I think so. Probably oh. was, yeah. We had chats because I had never met Brando, and he, I asked him what, he, what Brando was like. He's wonderful. A wonderful guy to work with. Mm -hmm. Great actor, you know. And of course, I remember the film, and I thought, wow, <laughs> here I am working with Jim Carter. <laughs> of course, I did uh, Ham Gunn. Mm -hmm. With Richard Boone. And, and Andy McLaughlin, too. Andy McLaughlin. Andy McLaughlin directed it. Mm -hmm. On the road. Road to Wickenburg. 
shot in Lone Pine. That's right. That's right. And, and Andy McLaughlin directed about 90 episodes of I, Have Gun, Will Travel. Yeah, I know. He, he, that was the only time I ever worked with yeah. uh, McLaughlin. And that was the only Have Gun I ever did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But again, uh, working with Bone, I mean, he was, well, you know, he had a reputation of being a pretty good drinker. Yes. And uh, I remember once we had a drink before we went to the bar and the restaurant, I had a drink. We had to get a drink to get to the bar. Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> and then it was his suggestion. I said, well, oh, I'm not going to argue with him, you know. And so <laughs> we walked across. It was only about a block away. And Time we, to stop for another drink then. On at, the at the bar. Well, no, <laughs> at the bar we did. Well, he had about three or four. I had two, and that was enough for me. But he, he was a pretty good drinker. He could, and it, you never know it. Mm -hmm. You never know it on him. And, and I hear he was a, a real hands-on producer too for that show. He, he oh yeah, watched everything. Oh, he was. He knew what was going on. Mm -hmm. He really knew. What Did he allow for a rehearsal time? Because I know on most shows, there's no time for No, that. there wasn't too much mm -hmm. rehearsal. You, mm -hmm. you got on the set, you better know your lines. Mm -hmm. you know? And of course, I always knew mine. Uh, some actors could come on, and I don't know how they did it, actually. They'd come on, and they'd say, well, well, let me see the script. And they'd say, and, and before we get through one take or just walking through it, they know the lines. I said, how do they do that? I think some people have that. Somebody. It's not fair. It's not fair. I'll tell you who did have is Jim Arness. Mm -hmm. Jim Arness, he and I, I was doing uh, Gunsmoke, and uh, we rehearsed a scene. You know, we had the pages in front of us, and we were about a three or four line, page scene. And uh, he rolled up the page and threw it away. I said, don't you want to do it again? And he said, well, yeah, if you want to. And I said, yeah, but don't you need the script? And he said, well, no. You see, I have a photographic memory. And I said, you what? <laughs> I said, damn you, you have a photographic memory. And the rest of us have to work so hard to memorize. And he said, he said yeah, I'm afraid I, once I've read it, I know it. Mm -hmm. I said, well, God bless you, my man. But and he was, he said, I'm doing with you again. I'm reading off the script, and he's got it memorized already, you know, reading it through one time. Mm. But he was he was a wonderful guy to work with. Well, you did several of those episodes, too, playing good guys and bad yeah, guys, too. Yeah. What was the the atmosphere like on set for Gunsmoke? Calm. It was always calm, always easy. The director always knew what... Uh, Jim wanted. Jim knew uh, knew what he wanted, and it was there was never any fuss. Uh, the actor playing Chester, what's his name? Dennis Weaver. Dennis Weaver. Dennis Weaver was kind of a cut up on set too. Well, he was, yeah. he, and he was very funny. He was a very funny guy. Mm -hmm. um, what was the film he did with Sean Heston? Oh, the Touch of Evil that Orson Welles evil. directed. Yes. Oh. And he's really good, and then he plays kind of a crazy an adult guy. guy. Yeah, really. yeah. Oh, yeah. And he, he said he talked it. Orson Welles directed it, of course, and uh, he said he talked it over with Orson Welles, and he said and they came to the conclusion that this guy was kind of ditzy and kind of crazy, and he said it was the most wonderful experience. And working with Wells, mm -hmm. you know, what could be better than that? And Marlena Dietrich was in that, too. Marlena Dietrich, you know, everybody. Yeah. Charlton Hessen playing uh, Hispanic. He, you know, he which played a Mexican. Actually. It's kind of yeah. tough. Yeah. Kind of tough. But it's still a great movie. Oh, it was wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful yeah. film. Is there anything that Orson Welles did for me? Did Orson you ever get a chance to meet him? I never did. I always wanted to. I never did. I always wanted to work in one of his pictures, and I, I never did. That's probably the bane of my existence. I worked in a lot of films, but nothing nothing really great. I didn't uh, have the opportunity to um, do a particularly great role or anything like that. I wish I had, you know. Well, a role that most people know you from is uh, Apollo on Star Trek. Oh, well... 
That's given me my 15 minutes of fame, actually. <laughs> oh, I tell you, that's lasted a lot longer than 15 I must say, it, you know, having, I worked five days on that show, five days, and I remember when I saw the script, the first time I saw the script, I thought, this is a better script that I've been used to, to doing. About three months or three weeks before, I had done a Western, I don't know which one, getting shot up and knocked down, beat up or something like that. Now, all of a sudden, I have this script, which is really quite good. And I thought, wow, this, uh, I hope I get the part. And after about five interviews, I finally got the part. Was that Gene Roddenberry? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, he had written The Road to Wickenburg, The Have Gun Will Travel, you did, too. I didn't write that. Yes. Is that right? Oh, yeah. my God. Small world. Oh, yeah. He, he got his chops going on Have Gun. Yeah, yeah. right. Well, when he did so many shows over the years, that, and so many of them I've forgotten. Like, I, I know that I... I can see the actor, but I can't see the name of the person, you know? In that Star Trek episode where you're playing Apollo, how do you keep it from being so silly? And he's sympathetic, too. That's a, an amazing performance. Well, you know, at the time, I was just playing for the reality. Uh, I never thought of it as being a sympathetic character. I think if you do as an actor, you're going to play the wrong thing. I played it as as it was written and as the director wanted it. I remember the last scene, the very last scene that, uh, that I'm in. And the director came up to me and he said, you know, I don't know, do you know the lines to the last scene? And I said, as a matter of fact, I do. He said, I'd like to do it. We'll cut in later on, but I want to do a master of it. If you think you can do it, I'd like to try it. I said, let's do it. That was a one take. One take. And I never missed a word. And it was... He said, cut and print. And it was, I thought, wow. And then they did close-ups and so forth. It was a wonderful moment. I mean, when you, when you do it right, because you don't always do it right, you know, and you hope you do it right. And um, But, you know, that's a lot with everything. Just a master shot with the one take, and it's a long stretch, yeah. and it's okay. If, as I said, if I tried to play him sympathetic, it would have been the wrong way to go. But when it comes out... Because of the way it was written and the way it worked with Leslie, it really worked. Mm -hmm. And I give her a lot of credit for making it work. She was wonderful. She really was. She was wonderful. The characters are so strong in those episodes, and I think that's why one of the many reasons that it holds up today, because certainly the sets weren't very expensive even for that time no no it's the scripts it's the characters it's the performances that bring those to life i think so i, I you know i don't I, I don't pretend to be a great actor or anything like it but i i think in certain ways i did some things in that particular film that i never had the opportunity to do in any other film. And it was the way it was written, by the way it was directed, and working with those people. All of the actors, the regulars in it, Bill included, of course, it all just came together. And it doesn't always happen that way in, in television shows particularly. But in this case, it did come together. Uh, and I was part of it. I wasn't the main part of it, but I was part of it. And it was as a result of everybody's contribution that it turned out as well as it did. Well, I think this conversation that we've had today has turned out well because of your contribution. All I did was <laughs> sit here and listen, and it was wonderful. So thank you, Michael, so thank much. Thank you, thank you. I've enjoyed it. I really have. I've enjoyed it. Well, cowboy, I guess it's time to uh, head uh, to the range or to the bar, I guess. You know, maybe we'll see the ghost of Richard Boone. <laughs>
<laughs> thank you for spending the afternoon with me. It was wonderful. I really enjoyed it. It was great fun reminiscing and recalling, sometimes not recalling the names of <laughs> some of the actors with whom I had worked all these years. It's a wonderful experience to kind of recall these people because, you know, they were part of your life. Um, it was important for what it was. And it's been thoroughly enjoyable for me. You've uh, contributed to so many of my favorite shows and to have seen those and grown up watching you and to be sitting here with you and spending the afternoon talking and reminiscing is is wonderful for me. I love to hear these stories. Well, you know, I, as much as I could recall, I mean, I love to tell them, of course. It's great fun. You're a great, uh, a great uh, asker of questions. Whatever. <laughs> Whatever I'm trying to think of. You know. um, anyway, it's been a pleasure for me. It really has. I've I appreciate it. it. Thank you very, very much. much.